Um, yeah, well, again, welcome to this um, fourth GLP um, Working Group for Telecoupling Research webinar. Um, today we are, or to start with, I'm Cecilia Fries. I work as an assistant professor at the University of Copenhagen in the section for geography. And I'm organizing this webinar together with Julie Zeringer from the CDE at the University of, of Bern, where she's working as a senior researcher. Um, and we're really happy to uh, welcome you here for the fourth webinar where we are going to discuss um, the challenge of governing telecouplings. Um, so discussing evidence on company policies for reducing commodity driven um, forest loss. And we're going to do that with two exciting presentations from um, two speakers uh, of, at the Department of um, humanities, social and political science at the ETH Zurich. So in the beginning here, we'll have Samuel Levy, um, who's a doctoral candidate in, in that department, um, talking about the role of, of market share and effectiveness of zero deforestation commitments in the Brazilian Amazon cattle sector. Um, and after that, we'll have Janina Grabs, who works as a postdoc in the same group, um, talking about effective or performative governance or asking that question. Um, in relation to the case of zero deforestation commitments in the Indonesian oil palm sector. And we'll have um, each of the presenters um, with the chance for clarifying questions after their presentations, and then we'll have time at the end for more cross-cutting discussion and um, sort of the bigger questions of, of that these talks raise. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen so that um, you can take over the floor, Sam. Uh, good, thank you. Uh, can you see uh, my screen? Yeah, but we see the, yes, perfect. Yep, yeah. okay, great. Um, Great, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'll be presenting uh, as described uh, my work on the role of market share on the uh, effectiveness of corporate deforestation policies in the Brazilian Amazon. This work is a collaboration between uh, myself and other members of the environmental policy group at ETH Zurich and also um, Holly Gibson's group uh, in Wisconsin Madison. Um, so why is this work important? Well, first of all, um, commodity production is the largest driver of forest loss globally. This is particularly true in the tropics, the world's most biodiverse and carbon rich region. And when I'm talking about commodity production, I'm primarily talking about four things, beef, soybeans, palm oil, and palm and paper. Um, these commodities are prim primarily cash crops. Um, they're associated with major economic gains for the regions and countries that produce them, although the distribution of these benefits is debated. Um, as a result of this tension between economic gains and environmental losses, governments across the tropics have tried to create policies that will decouple commodity production from deforestation. However, to date, this has not succeeded, and it is hoped that corporate policies may succeed where these public policies have not. The reason being is that although millions of producers across the tropics um, grow these goods, the number of companies that are involved in the transporting and processing of them to take them from the fields in Brazil and Indonesia to the uh, processed goods that we know and enjoy, like this burger and fries, um, are very limited. So there's this clear telecoupling here between international companies based in Europe and America and elsewhere and these producers in the field. And if the behavior of this handful of companies can be altered, this could affect the millions and millions of producers in their supply chains and protect huge areas of the tropics. And this is exactly what a zero deforestation equipment tries to do. So a zero deforestation equipment, a ZTC, is a sustainability initiative that signals a company's intention to eliminate deforestation from its supply chain. So a company like Nestle here in Switzerland uh, creates a policy about deforestation uh, saying they will no longer accept any producers, any product that has been grown on deforested land they communicate that to the traders they buy from, they communicate that to the farmers they buy from, and hopefully that results in behavior change on the ground. This isn't something which has just been uh, described as theoretically possible, but it's actually being implemented at scale right now. This figure is a little bit out of date, 
Um, so the number of these ZDCs is actually probably double this by 2020. And as you can see, it's being implemented across all major deforestation risk commodities, and indeed in all uh, major production regions. However, despite the scale of this uh, implementation, it's still quite unclear what the impacts of these policies are, particularly in the case of cattle. Um, the reason being is that previous studies uh, have found really mixed results. Some have found major negative impacts on deforestation, while some have found no impact at all. One reason we think for this is that there's no consistent way of actually measuring the impacts of ZDCs, the treatment of this policy um, consistently, which we think market share would be a really viable way to do so across cases uh, and across regions. Uh, so to give you an example of why we think that from the case I'll be talking about, uh, the Brazilian cattle sector, which looks a bit like this. So a cow is born, it goes to a number of farms and then is sold to a slaughterhouse where some magic happens and it becomes a burger. Um, when we introduce CDCs to this picture, it looks a little bit like this. So in the Brazilian cattle sector, CDCs are implemented by slaughterhouses and it's a market exclusion mechanism, which is primarily what CDCs are, which means that uh, this company will refuse to buy a product if you don't meet the standard of deforestation. So if you deforest, they will exclude you and they implement that by monitoring the deforestation on prospective buyers land. Now, as maybe you've already guessed, if the number of these EDC companies is low, their demand for deforestation free cattle or deforestation free anything um, can be met by a small number of suppliers that deforested long in the past or are more willing to stop deforesting than the majority of the produ producing population, which are reliant on deforestation. But as the number of these companies increase in a region, so the market share of this policy increases, uh, we would expect that the abilities to avoid the policy and therefore the amount of deforestation going on should uh, decrease. So our hypothesis here being that higher market share of CDC companies should reduce the opportunities to deforest. The Brazilian cattle sector is a great place to study this um, for a couple of reasons. First, it has one of the earliest CDCs. So CDCs here began in 2009. Um, they have clear implementation mechanisms, the satellite monitoring I already mentioned, and also they have pretty high market coverage. So previous estimates put it between 70 and 80% across the whole biome. So if market share is affecting, uh, market share of these ZDCs is affecting deforestation, we would expect to find it here. Um, there are two policies that coexist in the Brazilian cattle sector. One is called the Termo de Adjustamento de Conduta, uh, or TAC, and the other is known as the G4 Agreement. There are a couple of differences I'll quickly outline, but primarily they function in the same way, both using the satellite monitoring to exclude non-compliant producers. Um, so TAC was created by the Public Prosecutor's Office in the state of Pará, and then in 2014, uh, 2013 it spread out from that state, uh, and it's always implemented by the Public Prosecutors at the state level. Uh, the implementation of this satellite monitoring was a little slower uh, for TAC, so it kind of began gradually and varies between slaughterhouse companies. And the other difference is that the public prosecutor's office targeted uh, slaughterhouses known to be heavily involved in illegal deforestation to join this policy, uh, which gives us a, a selection bias, uh, which I'll come to how we try and control that later. Um, while for the G4 agreement, which was created by Greenpeace and targeted the four largest slaughterhouse companies of the, of the Brazilian Amazon, this policy um, was implemented across the biome uh, in 2009. The monitoring was pretty instant. And although Greenpeace targeted these companies for their deforestation, it was more at the company level rather than at the specific plant. So the targeting here is slightly different. And the reason why I emphasize this targeting point is because we think it's actually really important for the Brazilian cattle sector. So you can see here in Pará, which is the state where both policies began in 2009, uh, you have deforestation rate against time here. And I've split uh, the uh, two lines, one for municipalities with less than 70% ZDC market share and one with above 70%. And you can see here in Pará, uh, there's this early period, this sort of targeting period where ZDC market share is associated with more deforestation, after which there is a drop and ZDC market share is normally associated with low deforestation, lower deforestation. In Hondonia and Mato Grosso, where TAC expanded in 2013, 2014 being the first full year of implementation, we again see this, a similar looking kind of effect, but later on. So we think that targeting here does matter. Um, so just to quickly recap on the hypothesis that we 
hypothesis is that opportunities to deforest land for cattle should decrease as the market share of CDC companies increase. We are trying to answer this with two research questions. The first being, uh, what is the, the market share of these CDC companies, which we try and estimate at the municipal level? And the second is we put this estimate of CDC market share into economic econometric models and use this to see how that affects deforestation. Um, we do that for the three principal cattle producing states of the Brazilian Amazon, so Pará, Rondônia, and Mato Grosso, the three that were in that previous slide. These uh, cover the majority of both the forestation and cattle production in the Brazilian Amazon. So again, we're really targeting where these policies should matter. We use every year from the first full year of implementation, 2010, to the end of data availability uh, at the municipal scale using, uh, which we have 336 municipalities, of which 254 go into the econometric models because there's quite a big difference in both the implementation of the ZDCs and public policies in outside the Amazon biome. So it's very hard to compare these, so we exclude them. Um, in terms of how we construct the market share variable, uh, we collected data on um, the policies each company has made, which is actually at, not just at the company level, but for each company at, in each state, uh, which was collected by our colleagues in Wisconsin. We also identified where each sort of house was and then using available data on cattle movements, we modeled the uh, number of cows processed per slaughterhouse. And again, using this cattle movement data, estimated per slaughterhouse uh, what well, the expected sourcing zone, so that creating a radius around each slaughterhouse, we expect them to buy from. We combine this with administrative data and land use data to create this municipal level measure of CDC market share. And this is what it looks like. So, uh, in short, we do find, particularly from 2016 onwards, this estimate of 70 to 80%. Market share does seem to be right, but it's not true everywhere. You can see uh, both over time and over space, these clear differences. So there's a big increase in CDC market share from 2010 to 2016, followed by a sort of plateau period. You can also see pretty consistently that Mato Grosso here has higher market share than Pará, particularly northern Pará, and also Hondonia, particularly again the north. So there are these clear spatial and temporal differences in market share, which do create in many areas opportunities to avoid these policies. We can also see that uh, by the specific policy itself. So comparing G4 to TAC, I won't go into this in much detail, but you can generally see that G4 has a higher market share than TAC. And you can see that TAC market share increases after uh, the policy expands out of Pará in the north here to these other two states. So we then take this estimate, put that into a first difference panel regression with municipal clustered heteroscasticity robust standard errors. We won't go too much into the methods here, but please ask about them. Uh, so the user's estimate of CDC market share, which we do regressions both with it sum, so G4 and TAC together, and we split the two given these slight differences I mentioned. We interact that with this with a targeting dummy, which is pre-post these targeting years, which we define as the first year of implementation and before, um, as well as controlling for known confounders, such as the price of cattle, the amount of uh, forest and protected areas, pasture area, cropland area, and population, uh, the sources for which are here. Um, and this is what we find. So apologies here for the big table, but what you're looking at in the first column is the effect of some ZDCs with this targeting uh, interaction. The second column, we just have the CDC market share uh, without the interaction. And then the following three columns, you have G4 and TAC split. Uh, in column three, you might interact them both with a targeting dummy, assuming that targeting only affect the beginning of both policies in general, so 2010 and before. While here we allow for a targeting dummy that is specific to both the um, policy and also to the year that it was implemented per state. While column five just looks at the two different um, policies. Controls are included, but I've omitted them for this for space, but as one would expect, population and cultural area and prices are all positively associated with deforestation. So what we find here is as we would expect, ZDC market share is associated with negative deforestation. That impact is bigger when we control for this targeting year where ZDCs are positive. Um, this is 
we find that G4, which has, has this better, um, has earlier and more rigorous implementation at first, have a bigger impact on deforestation than TAC. And we also find that the impact of TAC is much more dependent on this targeting dummy. So when we use the um, ZDC and state-specific dummy, the impact of TAC doubles. When we don't have this interaction at all, we find that TAC has no significant impact on deforestation. So this separating the targeting really matters for TAC, but has doesn't affect the consistency of the consistent effect of G4 or ZDCs in general. Um, so for those of you that don't like tables, what does this mean? Well, a 1% increase in CDC market share based on column one is results in about a 0.7% decrease in deforestation after the targeting years, um, which is equivalent, we estimate to around 2 million hectares of avoided deforestation, um, which is super. So uh, very quickly, we find that market share is a viable way of measuring the impact of CDCs. Potentially that could be used in other cases. We find that ZDCs are reducing deforestation in these key cattle producing states of the, of the Brazilian Amazon. We find that TAC has a smaller impact on deforestation than G4, which we'd expect because of the monitoring um, implementation began later, and also its market share is lower. We also find that the impact of this is more sensitive to this targeting, which we implement through the dummy. But um, I would suggest that this difference between the two policies would decrease uh, if we had future years because the public prosecutor's office is increasing their uh, implementation mechanisms and the penalty on slaughterhouses that don't follow these rules um, over time. And they're also targeting new slaughterhouses to join the policy. So the market share and the implementation should increase. In terms of the policy recommendations from this, um, well, there's two things. First, ZDCs can be a credible way to reduce commodity-driven deforestation. And the second is that uh, we should if we, if we want to best use our efforts to increase ZDCs, we should focus on sectors where they already exist, trying to increase the market share there, rather than introduce ZDCs to sectors where there aren't already ZDCs, where the market share of this policy would be low and we'd see less of an impact. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time. And also to my co-authors, Rachel Garrett, Holly Gibbs, Federico Camelli, and Jacob Munger. Great, thanks a lot, Sam. Um... There is one clarifying question from Owen uh, Kortner in the chat. He is wondering what the year unknown in the chat on the number of CDCs over time reflects. It was in the beginning of your talk, I think. Um, the year unknown. Uh, I am not sure. If I may ask, it just, it yeah. could be well, it could be a small thing, but it was just the largest number. And you had it, um, it seems like the largest number of ZDCs were in an unknown year. So I was just curious if that was a lack of data or if it meant something significant about the way that ZDCs are counted in their implementation year. Um, I'm not sure where that was. Um, it was like slide two or three. The commitments, in the very beginning, the bar graphs. When you're introducing the number of commitments of firms. Ah, uh, sorry, yeah. yeah. Great. Um, that uh, isn't relevant for this case, which is why I was a little lost by the question, um, where we do know when each policy begins. Um, what I think this is more reflective of is that a ZDC, as maybe you can tell from this definition, it varies from this quite rigorous thing, like in the cattle case, to a more vague statement of um, intent that you can find on a company website, which is when this uh, supply chain, which collects all the data on these policies, they'll find it on a website, but they don't say any details about when they started it, how they're going to do it. And then that goes into this year unknown column. Okay. Um, Great. So that's kind of to say that, yeah, not all ZDCs are the same. Got it. Thank you. Great, we have a couple of more minutes for clarifying questions for Sam. If anyone has any questions, feel free to just jump in um, using your mic 
Yes, maybe I can make a question. How do you consider, how do you discriminate? Like you just say now, some companies put very vague statements or how do you classify what is a vague uh, and what is not based on what? Um, so that isn't work that I do specifically, but um, there are two organizations that do uh, work on that quite heavily. So supply chain um, is one of them. Another one is the, um, uh, Force 500 project, and they sort of define the rigor of these policies based on whether there is a clear implementation date, whether there's clear implementation mechanisms, and whether they have like a definition of what a forest is, because obviously, if there's no definition of what deforestation means, you can kind of wriggle out of the policy, uh, especially if you're not actually monitoring that. Um, so I think those are the, some of the key ways to look at the rigor of these policies. Um, in the Brazilian cattle sector, both of these policies that I study have an implementation date, which is they begin in 2009, and they have a clear implementation mechanism, which is the satellite monitoring. So I would say that they all pass the rigor test. Great, thanks. Anything else at the moment? All right, um, then you can think on with the Sam's talk in mind while we change um, over to the next talk. Thanks a lot again, Sam. Um, and Janina, feel free to start when you're ready. Great, let me just share my slide. There we go. All right, so thank you so much everybody also for inviting me. Um, my name is Yelena, I am a postdoc in the same group and um, I study the same type of phenomenon of um, zero deforestation commitments, but in a different landscape, which is the Indonesian palm oil sector and question how these kinds of commitments are being implemented there. And Sam already gave a really good introduction to the ZDCs in general. Um, in the palm oil sector, so you've seen that palm oil is also one of those forest risk commodities. It's the biggest one in Southeast Asia. And so since 2011 and with an uptick in 2015, companies have uh, made these no deforestation, no peat, no exploitation supply chain policies that link um, a ZDC with also an extension towards um, peat development and, and human rights. And this in the palm oil sector has also been quite successful, at least in scope. Um, it covers around three quarters of the Southeast Asian palm oil refining capacity, which is sort of one of the major bottlenecks, it's like refining and trading in a supply chain that is quite complex. And so my research question is how these are implemented in practice and how effective they are at reaching their goal of eliminating commodity-driven deforestation and, and peatland development. And um, this research is a bit newer and so the data is also, um, the results are in progress. Um, but what I've been doing for the past year is interviewing a lot of supply chain actors um, along the chain, as well as NGOs and stakeholders. So we have like over 50 interviews at this point. I've done a lot of data analysis of company documents, as well as digitized and traced supply chain lists of buyers. And I'm diving into geospatial analysis as well via Google Earth Engine, although those results are still very preliminary. And so just to start off with a brief overview, in the palm oil sector, we have a number of different implementation mechanisms. So it starts out with these supply chain policies that are quite similar to what Sam was describing, where a company makes this pledge. Um, they implement it via their supplier code and kind of um, distribute it amongst their suppliers that they will not accept deforestation linked products. Then they try to trace their supply chain, their supply base like all the way to the plantation, which is quite a feat in palm oil and use satellite based monitoring to oversee um, deforestation events. And if a deforestation event is seen, is linked to one of their suppliers, then there's a so-called grievance mechanisms that comes into place where companies will engage with their supplier, try to 
pressure them to stop clearing and also engage in remediation action at the threat of market exclusion. Uh, a second tool in this toolbox is um, third party certification via the round table on sustainable palm oil. And this round table certification has existed since 2005, but only in 2018 did they adjust their criteria to the point where um, purchasing RSPO certified volumes actually fulfills the pledge towards zero deforestation because they increase the rigor of their deforestation criteria and also peach development criteria. And a third and emerging strategy is a so-called jurisdictional approach towards um, low deforestation landscapes. And this is where at a subnational level, groups of companies will work together with, um, with subnational actors as well as NGOs to define key performance indicators on the production, um, the um, protection and inclusion aspects of moving towards sort of a more low deforestation development model. And so my question here is, does this toolbox of strategies allow us to address the different forms of deforestation that are happening on the ground? You may have seen the Swiss cheese model in the COVID context where different attributes and different types of strategies can sort of plug the holes of different ways of um, addressing a problem. And um, so I structure these deforestation issues in two ways. On the one hand, I focus on different actors and their sizes. And here, the dominant narrative has been between large scale concession actors who own and operate large plantations as well as small scale producers. So in Indonesia, it's commonly known that around 40% of the production surface is actually being operated by smallholder farmers. And so those are not, sometimes they're linked to the concession, but many of them are independent, have established sort of their own little oil, palm oil garden and are seen to be a lot more difficult to reach and to engage than the large scale actors. Um, as I've been talking to people in the field, a very interesting element has come up that there's a third type of actor that's been quite underexplored, which is, they call them petani perdasi. So those are farmers that wear a bow tie and are thus um, a lot more um, uh, sort of, they're based in the city, they tend to be, have political links or links to the military. And they have bought up a number of palm oil plots that are from smallholders, and this could own hundreds or even thousands of hectares of palm without actually having a concession, without having a business license, and sort of operating in the shadows under this broad smallholder umbrella. So the way in which those are being engaged is then quite important to also understand um, deforestation via expansion of those actors. And then the second type of stratification is around the temporal range. So of course we need to worry about current deforestation that's happening in the present, but also about long-term prevention of deforestation, especially on so-called land banks. So those are concessions that are held by companies that are already permitted for commodity production, but that are still forests. And so those are so-called stranded assets under the new NDPE framework because they can't be developed without kind of bringing the company out of the market, but can those be monetized in a different way? There's also an Indonesian guideline that in theory enables the state to take back concessions that are not developed and give them to another actor that would develop them um, in the in the commodity at hand. So that is a challenge that um, is at the front of people's minds as well, as well as thinking about past deforestation, especially um, in protected areas, such as here we see the Tesonilo National Park in blue. We see a lot of um, palm focused deforestation um, in green. And we see that because this is not in a plantation and in a concession in yellow, we would consider this as um, deforestation outside of concession that could be attributed to either of these actors basically. And how do we deal with, especially smallholder farmers whose farm lie within protected forest areas, they're therefore illegal, um, but um, otherwise if we take away their land, they may not have a livelihood. So I'll go through each of these actors in turn and talk a bit about how the deforestation strategies 
um, governance strategies to date have worked for them. So for the concessions, we do see evidence that there is now a tightening of the market and an increased signal that NDPE um, and adherence to NDPE is the new status quo. And some of the major elements there is the satellite monitoring that does appear to be sort of a, a signal that we are being watched. Um, another element was that as of 2015, banks, especially international banks, have come into play and also threatened the credit that producers rely on to um, finance their, their expansion. And so as banks have withdrawn credits, if companies were linked to um, deforestation and they had to refinance in the local market, this has become an even stronger economic incentive to, to prevent these types of practices. And there was a couple of really high attention cases that sort of set this example for other actors to at least not be the last in line. So not be the, the lame duck that will be shot at in the media and via NGOs and try to position oneself in the middle. Of course, a lot of the big actors um, have developed their land banks already. They did the deforestation in the past and they're sort of now sitting in a nice space of saying we can provide you with deforestation free product if we say that the deadline um, is 2015. Um, monetizing the land banks, this challenge that I spoke about, continues to be um, really difficult to do, especially as any type of way to monetize this existing land, for example, via carbon credits or sort of ecosystem payment for ecosystem services valuation would require a different type of, of license and permit other than the one that is now currently licensed for, for commodity development. So this still seems to be a big question mark in the minds of actors with very little ways to actually remedy the problem. If deforestation has occurred, we see that the grievance resolution mechanisms through these company specific guidelines sometimes work, but often they do not. And this is because there is still a lot of leeway in trying to verify deforestation and linking it down to a particular actor. We see that in this database that is um, one of the major NGOs that raises grievance cases, um, around one third of these are disputed on the basis of evidence regarding both whether there was a deforestation event, referring back to what is actually seen as deforestation, what is a forest, did we actually um, remove forest or do we have some sort of assessment by a third party that this was land that was okay to clear, as well as attribution. So even if um, concession boundaries are accepted, which sometimes they will also be disputed, they will say, well, it was community encroachment, it wasn't our company, so our company cannot be held liable for this development. And while this is often used as an excuse, there is a kernel of truth in it because this paper by Gavot et al found that we find a lot of smallholders, also in oil palm, that are located on what we know the best to the best of our knowledge to be concession boundaries. So that should nominally be um, controlled by companies. And we also see a lot of industrial oil palm that are lie outside of these concessions. And they're thus completely difficult to attribute to any one particular actor. And this might have some sort of connection to these um, farmers with the bow ties that I talked about before. In the smallholder area, um, this continues to be a big challenge to even trace down to the field. Now there's traceability to the mill level, but then as soon as you hit the mill, you need to interact with intermediaries, with agents who don't want to open their books and link um, companies to the smallholders. Um, and as especially downstream producers have been pushing for traceability to plantations, so for suppliers to be able to show all the way down to the palm oil um, garden um, where the supply comes from, there's a real risk that here smallholders and those more complex value chains are going to, going to be excluded in favor of a more integrated, more easy to track value chain. Um, in terms of engagement strategies, there's, there's few companies that have really um, pursued a strategy of exclusion of even smallholders that they're thinking might have deforested. There is 
a high sensitivity around the political risk of this as well. And so instead, they have tried to focus on engaging them on identifying high risk areas and um, giving farmers opportunities to increase their yields rather than expanding on land. Of course, this raises the issue of whether there might be a Jevons paradox as, as smallholders are getting more productive, they might have more reason to expand rather than um, continue for operating on their own land. Um, and now there's also a big issue around refinancing and the financing of replanting basically, um, which again, if you give these operators um, more um, resources, you need to make sure that they're not actually just expanding their land and keeping the current palm oil under development in a way to sort of hedge their bets, but rather replant on existing land to make sure that the concession area um, keeps, uh, keeps in place. And these jurisdictional approaches have popped up basically since 2015, 2017, but neither of them are really operational. It's a lengthy progress to actually put them together. Um, there is a lot of um, instability regarding political turnover as you need to establish political champions and leaders. And if those leaders change, um, there is a lot of work to be done to make sure that the agenda continues to be in place. And as a supply chain strategy, it also is quite unclear as companies don't yet know how to link these jurisdictional approaches to their supply chains and are uneasy to commit to preferential sourcing, for instance, before they know what the actual indicators will be. And in many cases, this is also a case of competing um, priorities as companies have now committed to zero deforestation, but from the bottom up indicators, many of them will not commit to zero deforestation, but to a lower deforestation because there is this push for um, continued development for the community, for instance. So here top down and bottom up really clash in the, in the goal and in the implementation as well. Finally, these land barons, these Etani Verdasi, um, they seem to be this Goldilocks actor that has enough capital to function and also to expand at a larger rate. They aren't as reliant on the international market, especially the European market, as the bigger international companies. They have a leaner cost structure than the big ones, which means that they can deal with somewhat lower prices even as they enter the leakage market. And, and they are said to be highly influential in political or military circles and are thus at the bottom of the priority list for companies to engage as long as there's other items to be ticked off. Unfortunately, because of the data situation, it's really unclear how widespread this problem is. Um, I've heard it from enough different types of stakeholders. I think it is a thing, but uh, it's also interesting that it can be easily used as a smoke screen in two ways, right? If there are these actors, they can hide themselves behind the smallholder label and say, the poor smallholders need to have more time to implement these things. But um, they're also a nice scapegoat for companies that are unwilling to really manage deforestation outside of their concession or perhaps at two levels removed by saying, these are the political actors that we can't touch. But the very few regulatory channels, at least from the private side, seem to be um, useful to, to actually govern these. Are we still losing forests for palm oil? Yes, but to a lesser degree. It's possible that this is linked to the fact that the price has been lower and there's also been a host of other strategies such as um, moratoria that all happened in the same time period. So it's gonna be very difficult to identify the effect of uh, zero deforestation commitments alone. I did try a very, very early version of this just by counting how many um, CDC buyers a certain mill sells to. And it does seem that mills that have more buyers have had both a trajectory of lower deforestation linked to them as well as lower rates at this point in time. And this holds both in general and for non-RSPO mills, so mills that are not certified. So there seems to be some sort of selection effort going on and maybe a um, giving them some sort of incentive, but uh, more work needs to be done in that area. And that is where I'll be moving to next as well with my work. Um, one last 
thing to note about telecoupling, one of the major leakage markets at this point seems to be not necessarily China or India, although this is still a concern, but actually the domestic market and the domestic tendency of expanding biodiesel. And so here, it's the question that I would raise to the audience if we're gonna start a discussion is also, how do we see telecoupling if then the domestic elements and the closer telecoupling becomes more and more important as we're trying to cut out the, the telecoupling that affects us as European consumers, for instance. So in conclusion, I think we had some success at addressing current deforestation of large scale concessions. A lot of other elements still need a lot of work and many of these seem to be particularly under the radar with very few uh, regulatory options if the state continues on its current um, positioning of actually pushing for palm oil expansion. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Janina, for the great talk. Um, are there any uh, clarifying questions for Janina's talk? No? Okay, great. Um, well, there is just one clarifying question, I think, from Caroline Franca in the chat for you, Sam. Caroline, Caroline do you want to ask the question directly? Oh, sure. Um, uh, I was just interested, and thank you very much for both presentations. Very, very uh, exciting. Um, I just want, uh, I was wondering about the prices data. I think you mentioned you use the prices data from SEAB. Seabi, uh, uh, Southern Brazilian state. And I was just curious why was that uh, the best um, uh, data set for, for that? And uh, well, I actually, a follow up question to that is that if you explored other uh, cattle prices data, uh, other data sets. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for that question. Um, so, in terms of uh, why that was chosen. Um, this, so this previous study found that by using the prices from uh, Paraná, which like you said is in, in the south of Brazil, and uh, modifying that by the share of that municipality that is pasture. Um, so do you get this like, you modify the price by the likely impact of that price for each municipality. Um, the, this study found that this was a, a very viable way of um, creating a municipal specific price, which can then be used in panel data. Um, to my knowledge, there aren't many sources of cattle prices that uh, for Brazil that one can do that with. Um, and this was shown to be very successful by this uh, 2015 paper by SM Sal. Um, I didn't look at different sources, um, given that this had previously worked very successfully, but I did compare the effect of um, looking at this variable in uh, Brazilian HIIs and also in USD and found that the, although the, the variable had pretty consistent results, when you include this exchange rate factor, it did seem to be, have a more significant positive impact on deforestation. Super, thanks. Great. Um, then we have a couple of questions for, for Janina from Ahmed Assis. Do you want to ask your questions? Yes. Hello. Good afternoon, uh, everybody from Ghana. Uh, I work with the Partnerships for Forest uh, for Palladium on some of these uh, issues that have been uh, discussed here. And thank you very much, uh, Janina and Samuel, for the wonderful presentations. I had just a couple of questions. Uh, Janina, I wanted to actually ask um, how effective, from your experience, do you think uh, some of these RSPO certification uh, is in terms of uh, eliminating deforestation from uh, these company supply chains. But in your conclusion, I see that you categorized them and then indicated, you know, some of them limited uh, extent of success. Uh, and, and, and I think there's scope to do more. So if you can, at least from your experience in Indonesia, if you can throw a little bit more light around that, that would help. 
And then, I mean, following from that, there have been some instances where some of these companies, uh, I don't know if there's anybody from Wilma, but at least I know Wilma, you know, have been fingered uh, for issues of deforestation. Uh, I mean, 2017, 2016. Uh, from your experience, again, what would you think uh, actually accounts for this? Is it that they don't do, and, and I mean, they have made commitments, right? So is it that they don't do a uh, proper, you know, downstream level due diligence on their supply chain partners? Or is it a case of maybe some of these entities, maybe Mighty Earth, et cetera, actually they themselves having to do more than, than just uh, fingering some of these companies? Or is it a case of not really understanding the realities on the ground? Because as you said, some of these things are actually disputed. If you read the reports and the narratives, um, Wilma comes out to, to counter counteract some of these things. So maybe what's also the reality uh, on the ground. And then the last one has to do with um, this issue of increasing productivity per hectare. Uh, when you talk about increasing productivity per hectare, and I think you made the point that there's a tendency that, you know, it could incentivize people to uh, expand even more, you know, creating that kind of a perverse incentive. So at a local level in Indonesia, what kind of mechanisms do they have uh, to kind of um, curtail some of these uh, potential negative uh, incentives? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Aziz, for, for really good questions. Uh, in terms of how effective RSPO certification is to, to curtail deforestation, um, I think Kim Carlson just had a really good paper out together with Robert Heilmeier, where they look at exactly that question in a much more rigorous way, um, quantitative way. And basically the, the main insights coming out of their work is that the main, the main benefit is going to be likely in company supply bases and not necessarily for the plantations themselves. Because so if these large integrated players tend to only get certified if they've already um, finish their supply-based development um, in, in a short way. And we've seen that certification of large-scale actors is kind of plateauing at this point. And as these requirements become stronger, I my perception is that it's doubtful that more people like large-scale actors will get certified. But if the mill is certified, they will check for um, the legality at the very least of the supply base. And so um, suppliers, that may have expanded on like the legal forest area in Indonesia might then um, not be able to access that mill. So um, there's a little bit of evidence there, but um, my, my perception is that RSPO certification mainly has identified the people that, that deforested it earlier in a way. But I mean, there are other elements to it, especially in, in human rights. Um, and, and exploitation where they're trying to really um, push the needle ahead and and the new planting procedures, which is a, um, a way of identifying steps that need to be taken to, to prepare the land has been applied by those multinationals as they've expanded, for instance, in Africa. So Olam has expanded in Gabon. Um, there's been um, Saim Darby in Liberia and they've really tried to um, assess where there is forest, high carbon stock forest. And um, I mean, there's also contestation by local communities and by NGOs over those processes. But from my understanding, at least there has been a lot more focus on both the deforestation and the, the due diligence and the free prior and informed consent than there would have been otherwise. In terms of Wilmar continuously being associated with deforestation, and I was just reading an article today about this again, it's kind of this recurring theme. Um, I think it has to do a lot with the way that these grievance mechanisms tend to work. So you have to understand that companies that, lie, that are in the mid level of the supply chain, they have two competing incentives. On the one hand, they want to maintain the supply base as extensive as possible. Like it hurts them if they cut out the supplier because it reduces their choice and it reduces their, their market power. And they also argue that it, um, they lose their control over the supplier if they just 
stop selling, stop buying from them. And so I think there has been um, like the, their, their um, threshold for action is quite high. They want to make really sure that the deforestation is associated with the particular supply. And so then these instances of I had an high carbon stock assessment that somebody did, but it wasn't peer reviewed, but this can show you that my um, my land clearing is actually not on primary forest cover. Those types of arguments that are put forth by the supplier that is non-compliant will be taken much more seriously by the company than by the NGOs that are involved in this action. And then it's quite difficult for me as a researcher to make a final claim on who is right in those kinds of situations. I think there's, you know, like, it would be better to have sort of a more independent um, verification of, of, of these types of grievance procedures. Unfortunately, they are still mainly in-house. So what happens is that the grievance is raised to the company and then it kind of like, like goes into the internal procedure. And there are, I think, valid claims that you need to make sure that you're punishing the right person for the right organization for the right thing. But there's also strategic elements in kind of keeping open. Um, like, I think there is sort of a tendency for more leniency in cases that are less clear cut for strategic reasons. And then the increase in productivity per hectare, what I've heard, and this is the only, the only time that I've really seen this being addressed properly is that occasionally they will, um, Musi Mas, for instance, is a company that comes together with communities and tries to come up with like a participatory or actually, sorry, this is um, Golden Agri Resources. They do this participatory land mapping and then they try to come up with a community regulation that enshrines what area will be continued to be preserved and what area will be continued to be developed. And the my understanding is then the productivity support is sort of uh, conditional on the, those regulations being implemented, although at this point it's too early to tell whether that will be successful or not. Thanks a lot. Um, there's a uh, comment for you in the chat, Janina, you can you can look at it perhaps. But there's also a question for Sam from Nils Sunago. Um, would you like to ask your question uh, directly? Uh, yes, I'd like to, to ask my question. Um, I hope you can all hear me. I had some problems with the sound. It's but, fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, well, thank you very much for some really interesting presentations. Um, and uh, good morning to, to all of you. Um, I have a question for Sam uh, with regards to, uh, to the issue of parallel so supply chains and the efficiency of, of CDCs. Um, I've been doing a project where we've been working with some people from the Brazilian beef sector. And uh, many of them, they actually highlight the initial success of these uh, CDC commitments, but also that it sort of ended up creating some parallel su supply chains with producers that weren't able to, uh, to comply with those commitments and simply were excluded. And they didn't stop producing because of that. So, so they, they sort of highlighted that we were able to, to make uh, within a few years, uh, very efficient uh, monitoring me mechanisms to implement those mechanisms to guarantee uh, zero deforestation products for exports, but we're still going to have those parallel supply chains internally and a lot of deforestation associated with that, mainly related to operations that aren't that, they don't apply very good uh, pasture management practices, they sort of depend on deforestation and it's, it's basically more backwards operations and not, they're not going to stop producing. So, so couldn't you maybe highlight that, that the CDCs have some, some eventual limits, like they've been good for some more structured operations, but in order to sort of really curb cattle driven deforestation, you would need some other kind of, or at least some supplementary mechanisms, such as landscapes approaches, some, some kind of sustainable re-inclusion of producers, where you provide them with the, the, the necessary inputs for, for them to produce in a more sustainable way, and also implementation of public legislation, such as the forest code. Um, so, so would you agree with that, that there's some sort of eventual limits, they're not going to do it by themselves, um, that, that we're seeing with CDCs, uh, or do you think that you can, you can actually use CDCs uh, in order to sort of um, to sort of uh, curb that remaining deforestation we're seeing, which is still significant. Um, that's a great question. It's something which we really uh, think about uh, a lot in our group. Um, I I very much do not think that CDCs are a panacea. I don't think that they could solve the problem 
alone. Um, we, yeah, one factor is that producers are still going to keep producing as long as they have someone to sell to. Um, which of course, if CDC market share was 100%, we would expect these opportunities to be less. Um, some of these branches with low productivity and precarious production that you, you mentioned uh, were already excluded from selling to ZDC um, slaughterhouses because they primarily form the, the key um, part of the indirect supplier base. So the smaller farmers, they have these really low productivities and they sell to these bigger guys that maybe can meet these um, restrictions. There's a paper in review led by um, uh, one of our group members, Federico Camelli, where, um, yeah, he, he really shows that there's the main group, which, which really is excluded are these um, indirect suppliers that aren't actually being monitored by the policy already. So if the policy expanded to them, then the effectiveness of the CDC could increase, but there'd be very negative equity implications for these small family farmers that probably wouldn't be able to meet these requirements. Um, in terms of implementing the forest code, so the, the TAC policy, that it, one difference that I didn't mention because in a lot of areas it works out as the same is that the TAC policy is about zero um, illegal deforestation. So it's really about compliance with the forest code while the G4 is zero deforestation. In uh, non-frontier areas, this works out the same, so I didn't emphasize it, but um, the TAC policy really is trying to be another incentive for compliance with the Brazilian Forest Code. Of course, the government right now isn't trying to emphasize that point themselves, um, except through this public prosecutor's office campaign. Um, and in terms of trying to find these like more equitable solutions that can involve public policy more, um, that's also something that our group is trying to do. So we're working on implementing a, a randomized control trial, again, uh, being led by uh, Federico Camilli and our group um, chair, Rachel Garrett, along with collaborators in Brazil, that will hopefully get at some of these um, ways of in including more people and using more means. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Sam and Janina. Time is flying when um, in good company and with interesting topics. Um, so we are just about to close this webinar. Um, you are welcome to uh, reach out to any of the speakers if you have further questions for today's topics. You're also always welcome to reach out to Julie or me if you have any ideas for future webinars. Um, we are open to host any um, interesting topics related to a broad spectrum of research um, in relation to telecoplings and land use change. Um, we are working on the next one for early, um, early 2021, I guess, um, but more, more on that um, later. Uh, so just again, thanks a lot, Janina and Sam, for uh, taking time out to talk to us about your interesting research and thank, thank you all for joining. Um, we'll see you in 2021. Uh, hopefully also in person at some point in that year. <laughs> but have a good uh, afternoon or good day or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, yeah, bye.